environment better. A lot of those, a lot of those uh, mutations are actually the breaking of pre-existing uh, right. cellular machinery. And it's a, right. lot, it's a lot easier to break something than it is to make something. Uh, right. and, and so I, I think that if Darwinian evolution you know, proceeded over a long period uh, unaided, well, the, the genomes, the, the information in the DNA of, of a lot of organisms would simply go south over time. Uh, so I don't think you, even given more time with just a Darwinian process, uh, you'd be able to get from something simpler to something, you know, from a from a bench to an anteater or, or whatever mm -hmm. the, uh, the progression was. Right. Um, and, you know, what's, what's interesting about this, and I've wanted to ask you this in a way for over a decade, is, okay, let's say that um, random mutation, as we're taught, can only explain something which, frankly, I've always found a little boring and undramatic, like the finch's beaks. Like, I read the book about that. That was nice. But it's just these dull little birds and these minor beak variations. What I wanted to see was how some ugly shrew-like thing became all of today's mammals. How did that happen? And none of the science that we have now can explain it. And you're saying, basically, that except for boring little variations, this kind of shrew versus that kind of shrew, and who cares about shrews, that really it's intelligent design, let's say that it's God, and not what Darwin said. The problem with this is, and when I say that I don't want to believe in God, it's probably because of this. The problem with that is, isn't that a little dull? Like a lot of people would say, well, you're just giving up. But of course, you would say science is showing us that this is the way it is, and so too bad we do have to give up here. But nevertheless, aren't you implying that the process that takes us from some little multi-tuberculate to an armadillo to you and me, aren't you implying that that process is something that we just can't really know anything about? It's irreducibly complex, it's extremely complex, maybe we can describe it, but we can't go any further than that. We can't know how it developed. We can't know how God developed it. Is that the way to put it? I'm not accusing you of giving up, but isn't, doesn't that bore you a bit? Don't you find that a little frustrating? Doesn't it make your research a little bit inert? Well, you understand. Yeah, I, I do understand your objection. I, I've actually heard that before. Uh, um, there's a, a historian of science named uh, Will Provine at Cornell, uh, and that's his big objection. He says he, he thinks this is boring, you know. Who, care, who cares, you know, somebody comes in and designs it, you know, what's the fun of that? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> well okay. Uh, and I say, you say, well, you know, science has to describe things the way they are, you know. we. You know, it would be nice if the universe were the way we want it to be, but the job of science is to go out and figure it out. And, and actually limits, uh, finding limits is really the part of all theories in, in science. Uh, i give you an, an example. How about Einstein's theory of relativity? He said that mm -hmm. nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Well, now, isn't that boring? <laughs> how come yes. you know, that, that stops research into you know, how, how things can go faster than the speed of light and, and how we could get across galaxies in a, in a split second? But nonetheless, that's, that's apparently the way things are. And, and if he said, oh, well, you go ahead, but I'll bet against your experiment succeeding in getting things uh, to go faster than the speed of light, uh, you know, we, would, we would understand it. He, the, the, uh, the idea of the theory is to show you what's a good question and, and what's not a good question. Trying to find out what can go faster than the speed of light, according to Einstein, is not a good question to ask. And if you, if you spend a lot of time there, you're, you're probably going to be wasting your time. Uh, in the same way, intelligent design says a question like, how did uh, an eyeball evolve by random mutation and natural selection? Is, is just a bad question because it didn't happen that way. So let's spend, <laughs> let's spend our time trying to figure out how, how it did happen. Well, I don't know. I, um, <laughs> the anteater has this long tongue and it's sticky. And most animals don't. And that evolved somehow. And it's impossible to explain how that happened via random mutation, I assume, the muscles and the chemicals, etc. Your version would be, and I don't mean this in mockery, God made the proteins interact that way because God had some plan that there would be this peculiar toothless creature with that tongue. And 
there it goes. Now that, I respect that. If that's really the way it is, then it's, the, it's important for a scientist being empirical to understand that that's the way it was. And there's a part of me that wants to accept that and think, well, the reason that you know people believe in God and that people still do, that all of this is justified, there really is something larger than chemical interactions, and isn't that absolutely fascinating? That's fun in a way. Novelty can be striking, but doesn't it make you also want to figure out what that something more is and hope that it would be something scientific? I mean, clearly it taxes our imagination. It taxes our ability to conceive of things. It's almost like imagining a fourth dimension. But do you find it really impossible that we might, in 50 years or 100 years, crack some kind of code that would explain the evolution of this kind of complexity. And it should be said, the complexity theory, which you flag in your book of the Kaufman type, does not 